Hi, everybody, and welcome back to the brand new North Carolina Sports Network and this new look version of the David Glenn Show. Whether you are watching our quickly growing YouTube channel, and please subscribe, it is free if you haven't already, or you're listening to our podcast right now, thank you for being with us here in mid-September. With college football season already offering some shocking and thrilling results, Week one in the NFL offering a disappointing but predictable start for the Carolina Panthers and a crazy injury to new Jets quarterback Aaron Rodgers. And the dust finally seeming to settle after this latest round of conference realignment in college sports, which saw the Atlantic Coast Conference undertake a very divisive vote recently with UNC, Clemson and Florida State all dissenting. That will bring three far away universities, Cal Berkeley, Southern Methodist, and Stanford, as new members and create an 18 school super conference starting next summer. As always, we appreciate you spending some time with us this week here on our YouTube channel, the new podcast, and hopefully our new multi purpose website, ncsportsnetwork.com, as well. We will get into many other topics of the week here in the North Carolina sports world and beyond a bit later with a little NFL and a lot of college football, including our three to see games, meaning the three college football matchups most worth watching this coming weekend, both here in North Carolina and around the country. We'll also offer a bottom line summary of the ACC's expansion news that you probably have not seen or heard anywhere else given that only a handful of media members truly understand all of the forces that were in play during that somewhat antagonistic process. But today's show also includes, among its highlights, a one-on-one visit with another of the most prominent college football coaches in our great state, Mike Houston of East Carolina University, who will join us shortly. With Coach Houston's visit in mind, please remember that our often personal one-on-one chats with Dabo Sweeney of Clemson, Dave Doran of NC State, Mike Elko of Duke, Dave Clawson of Wake Forest, Sean Clark of Appalachian State, and even college football legends such as Lou Holtz, Steve Spurrier, and Rod Broadway are available at both our YouTube channel and our website, ncsportsnetwork.com. UNC's Mac Brown, a college football Hall of Famer already and a national championship coach already who has been a guest on my various platforms dozens of times over these last 36 or so years. Believe it or not, I'm one of the few media members who covered both his introductory press conference in Chapel Hill way back in December of 1987 and his introductory press conference in Chapel Hill in November of 2018 for his round two, if you will, as the head coach of the Tar Heels. Coach Brown has promised to join our show once again soon. Back to today's special guest. Mike Houston was born here in North Carolina, in the town of Franklin. If you haven't been there, it's way out in the mountains, southwest of Asheville, actually not far from the Tennessee border to the west, and not far far from the Georgia border, yes, Georgia, to the south of Franklin. He was raised in North Carolina. He played high school football here in North Carolina, and then he played college football here as well at Division II Mars Hill, which is a little north of Asheville. When he played there, it was actually Mars Hill College. Now it's known as Mars Hill University. One of the most remarkable aspects of Coach Houston's history is that through his 30 years of coaching at the high school and college levels, he has never worked outside the three-state footprint of North Carolina, South Carolina, and Virginia. That is extremely, extremely uncommon in the vagabond world of a football coach who in his case is now in his 50s. Another fascinating aspect of Coach Houston's story is that he has never, in more than a decade as a college head coach, had a program take a major step backward from one year to the next. Whether you look at his record at at Division II Lenore Rhine or at the FCS level at the Citadel in South Carolina or James Madison University in Virginia, or even these past four seasons at ECU, His programs have always either roughly maintained their level from the previous season, or far more often, they have improved from the previous season. Given his Pirates 0-2 start this season after an 8-5 campaign last year that ended with a bowl victory, that sensational streak may be very difficult to extend, although obviously there is still plenty of time for ECU to turn this season around. 
We will see Coach Houston and his team in person twice this year as part of our Old North State Tailgate and Traveling Sports Circus, both this week as the Pirates take that four- or five-hour drive up the mountain to take on the App State Mountaineers, and also next month in Greenville when ECU hosts future ACC member Southern Methodist in a Thursday night national TV game on ESPN at Dowdy Ficklin Stadium. We hope to see you in either or both of those places. More on those details later in today's show. As we settle in with Co Coach Houston, quick thanks to our sponsors, without whom we would not be here with you today. The North Carolina Pork Council, the foundational partner of the new North Carolina Sports Network. Did you know that the pork industry contributes more than $10 billion per year to our state's economy and supports more than 44,000 jobs? XL Moving and Storage, who are celebrating their 25th anniversary this year and as an allied van lines agent can help you with your moving and storage needs here in North Carolina, but also well beyond our borders. The Lawson Insurance Group, where the Lawson brothers and their staff are ready to help you all across North Carolina, just as they've already helped me, my family, and my company save thousands of dollars on our various policies with your personal and or commercial insurance needs. Jimmy's Bar and King Neptune Restaurant, my personal home away from home in Wrightsville Beach. I get rave reviews every time one of our viewers, listeners, or readers tells me about his or her first visit or the inevitable return visits to King Neptune. The Original Salt Works, a legendary breakfast and lunch place in Wilmington, where Mike Waddell and I recently had lunch one day, then breakfast the next day. There are actually two very creative and different menus. Shout out to our friend Bob Hubbard for his hospitality and ongoing support. And our guys at Sport Clips, now with more than 70 locations across the great state of North Carolina. As we thank all of them, we also ask you to support us here at this new version of the David Glenn Show by patronizing those sponsors as often as possible. We actually have some new sponsors to announce soon. It is not even a slight exaggeration to say that without them and a different way, without you, we would not have the honor of sharing time with you on these new platforms here at the DG Show and the North Carolina Sports Network. On the other side, East Carolina head football coach, Mike Houston. What does it mean when people say America is a land of opportunity? It means the power to discover. To redefine yourself. To improve yourself. To challenge yourself. To realize there's more in you than you ever knew that you could do. It means giving people an open field to explore what they do best. With the best tools. The best training. The best technology in the world. We bring out the best in the people who serve. So you can be all you can be. Okay, without further ado, we move on to our featured guest of the week. He was born here in North Carolina, raised here in North Carolina, played and coached high school and college football here in North Carolina, and now is the head coach of one of the most prominent FBS programs in our state. Mike Houston first joined the David Glenn Show about a decade ago when he was in his first job as a college head coach and in the process of leading Lenore Ryan University, based in Hickory, North Carolina, to the Division II National Championship game in 2013. He then had great success at both the Citadel in South Carolina and James Madison University in Virginia, including leading JMU to the 2016 FCS National title and being named the FCS National Coach of the Year in that same season. Now in his fifth year at East Carolina, he has led the Pirates to back-to-back -back bowl invitations, including an eight and five record and a Birmingham bowl victory just last season 
Coach Mike Houston, welcome back to the David Glenn Show and welcome for the first time to the new North Carolina Sports Network. How are you? I'm good. Good to see you again. Well, thank you, Coach. Uh, hey, about 30 years ago, you were applying to medical schools, including those at ECU and UNC. And I remember someone even recommended that you might be good at pharmaceutical sales. Uh, remind us, how and why did you end up choosing this football coach's life instead of those things? The, the, the dean at the two schools that I applied to put me on a waiting list. And, uh, and so that, uh, that took care of getting in that first year. And then uh, the dean at East Carolina University uh, recommended that I, uh, I try to get a job in, uh, in, in one of the pharmaceutical companies in RTP and uh, Dean Hayek. And I think he still lives in East North Carolina somewhere, but I don't know if, uh, if he remembers that, but I do. And, uh, and I, so I went and looked into that and just, uh, I was like, I just, I don't, I don't see myself doing this. I was planning on reapplying to med school the next year. So I called my college coach and, and said, listen, the only other thing I've ever thought about doing uh, besides med school is, is teaching and coaching, you know, can you help me out? And uh, he helped me get a job uh, at a high school just outside of Winston-Salem uh, teaching. I, I, was, I was teaching chemistry and physics and I was coaching football and basketball. And it was about, I don't know, three or four months into it. And uh, I was like, I love this. This is, this is what I want to do. And uh, I've, I've never looked back. And so, uh, you know, I think God, God has a way of opening doors and uh, shutting doors. And uh, that was probably the first big one that he opened and shut. You and your wife, Amanda, have two boys, Owen and Reed. And it's been cool over this last decade. I can actually picture, I think it's your older son, like on stage with you as you're celebrating a national championship, which is just incredible. And now they're older, so they're probably having even more fun. Uh, but when you first met, can you remind us, was Amanda more like the recruit who needed some convincing to join Coach Houston or more like the recruit who was ready to sign that letter of intent right away? Well, you know, I like to tell it that she was recruiting me, but uh, <laughs> you know, probably probably the uh, probably the most accurate uh, version is that, uh, yeah, I had to, I had to work pretty hard to, to recruit her. So but uh, she's the top prospect I've been able to sign. I can promise you that. Hey, some of your players describe you as old school with your approach to football, both on and off the field. Do you still have all the same rules I remember you telling me about literally a decade ago? You know, be 10 minutes early, no hats or hoodies, uh, sit toward the front of the classroom for academic reasons. Um, what else is on that list and have you changed that list over the years? Well, I think I think I've evolved. Uh, there's You have to evolve. Uh, I think I've evolved a lot uh, as a coach. Um, those rules you mentioned are still in place, though. Uh, we'll have a we'll have a two thirty team meeting this afternoon. It'll probably start about two fifteen or two twenty. <laughs> uh, nobody will have a hat or a hood on. They'll sit upright and uh, and they'll greet me with a voice that uh, you know that that you know you would expect from a young man that has something about him. And uh, I I, th I just think there's certain things that are important. Uh, you know, when you're shaping young men and preparing them for the world. Um, you know, we want to win football games. That's I understand what my job is, but I think uh, I think uh, just as just as important and maybe more important is when a young man leaves this program. You know, I want him prepared to be successful in life. Uh, I want him to be able to navigate the obstacles and the adversity. I want him to be able to, you know, be a positive role model. Uh, I want him to to be able to be highly successful and be able to provide great things for his family. Um, you know, this, this sport uh, gave me the opportunity to go to college. Uh, it changed my life. Uh, and, and, I, and I owe that opportunity that, that uh, a coach many, many years ago gave me. I owe that opportunity to what I have today with being able to support my family and, and live the life I live. You played at Mars Hill, Division II. You've coached at Division II. I mentioned your success at the FCS and FBS levels. We can see from the outside coach that, you know, financial resources are different as you go up the ladder. Media coverage right. is different. Stadium sizes get bigger and all that. How do you describe what are the biggest differences in either how to build a winner at different levels or even the differences among the actual football being played on the field at those various levels? It's a lot different. Um, I, I got to coach a lot more when I was coaching Division II ball. You know, I actually <laughs> – <laughs> you don't have still, people like me getting in the way, right? <laughs> I actually still coached the position and I, I coordinated the defense. And, you know, I, I, did, I did a lot of things that, uh, you know, 
you just don't have the time to, to focus on, on just that uh, at this level. Um, you know, there, there, there are a lot of differences. Uh, there are a lot of a lot more things to, to handle, uh, both from the player standpoint and the coach's standpoint in this level. There's a lot more things to navigate. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, we try to keep the focus on what's most important, and that's, you know, those players. Uh, and, you know, we try just like I did, you know, 15 years ago at Lenore Ryan, we try to focus on having positive relationships that are genuine with our players, uh, being very involved in their personal lives uh, and, you know, building a relationship of trust and, uh, you know, and, and, and caring about each other. Uh, because I think that's the foundation for any uh, healthy program. And, uh, you know, you're going to go through some, some, some valleys and, and mountaintops uh, in, any, in any program. And I think how you navigate those uh, successfully uh, depends on what kind of relationships you have. And so uh, it's, it's still, it's still for us uh, a very much a relationship-based deal with our players. One of the most fascinating parts of your story as a head coach is that you've just won at four different places and four different ways to varying degrees. But another fascinating aspect, Coach, I don't know if I, I've ever met a football coach. You're almost 52 years old, and you've never worked <laughs> and lived outside a three-state footprint of North Carolina, South Carolina, well, and Virginia. I mean, I just, I don't know if I've ever seen it. Has that been intentional on the part of you and Amanda and your family? And do you think it's been an advantage in recruiting or any other way that, heck, you've probably been to most of the hundred counties in North Carolina by now? Um, it has been intentional. Um, you know, we've both, both at the Citadel and at, and at James Madison, um, especially at JMU, you know, I, I had a lot of opportunities uh, all across the country. Uh, I mean, we, we had some in the, uh, you know, pretty, pretty far west. Uh, we had some, you know, a little bit farther north. And, um, you know, just our family was very important to us. Uh, my family and Amanda's family both are in North Carolina. Um, I do think, you know, my connections with the high school coaches in you know Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, uh, down into Florida. Um, you know, I, I think I, I know so many of them. Uh, I do think that's a strength in recruiting. Um, you know, if it was the right opportunity for our family, you know, we would go wherever. But we have been, you know, pretty intentional with trying to stay regional. I have seen some fans, coach, reach for the panic button after the Pirates' zero and two start. Now, one of those two was the Michigan Wolverines. Uh, do you have a message for Pirate Nation at this point, or is all of your message designed for the young men in that locker room? Well, I think there's messages for both. Um, you know, with our players, we have to stay focused on, um, you know, pushing ourselves to improve every single day. Uh, and, and really, they've got to focus on blocking out the outside distractions, the outside noise. We, we talk about it year round. You know, if we had started 2-0, and I would be talking to them about blocking out the distractions and blocking out the outside noise because it's so extreme uh, one way or the other, depending on how you played last Saturday. Uh, you know, if we were 2-0, and uh, I would be worried about them, uh, you know, listening to how good they were too much and setting them up for failure. Uh, and the same thing with, you know, a, a challenging start. Uh, it's, you know, they can't listen to everybody tell them, you know, how they're how they're not very good uh, because we do have a very solid football team here. Um, we knew it was going to be a challenging preseason uh, non-conference schedule, uh, very challenging. Uh, we had a great chance to win last week. We had the lead in the fourth quarter. We had the ball. We had the momentum. We were driving. We didn't do things we needed to do down the stretch to win the ball game. Um, you know, it's it. it it's going to it's going to be a deal where we're going to improve every single week. Uh, you know, we have some experience in some spots, and in some spots, we're playing some very young players, and they're making some mistakes that young players make. Uh, but one thing about it, we have great men, uh, we have great players, uh, we have people that care about each other, we have people that are working their tails off, and we have people that are passionate about pirate football and passionate about winning here. Um, so if they're hitting the panic button after uh, two games, uh, that's uh, that maybe says more about them than about us. We're going to get you out of here with what we call our lightning round, Coach. In our final couple of minutes, 
we hit you with a question. You can make it a one word answer, a 30 second answer, but very quickly. It's brought okay. to you by King Neptune Restaurant and Jimmy's Bar in Wrightsville Beach. The next time you're in the Wilmington area, viewers and listeners, please plan to have a weekend brunch or an insanely tasty dinner, best of the beach style, with our good friends Jimmy Galise and his amazing wife, Keaton. What they have done with that King Neptune restaurant is a sight to behold. Okay, coach, quick answers here. Uh, place each of the following in order of your preference. Beach house, lake house, or mountain house? I'd say beach house, mountain house, lake house, in that order. All-time favorite family trip or trips outside the United States? So Amanda and I took the boys last summer, not this summer, last summer to Turks and Caicos. Uh, and, uh, and the boys, they picked the trip, and so we had a <laughs> blast. It was awesome. <laughs> Name a few of your favorite bands or musicians. Oh, uh, Bon Jovi, Journey. Uh, Got to start with those two. Nice. Um, you know, probably uh, probably some Phil Collins somewhere in there. Um, you know, maybe some White Snake, uh, Motley Crue. All Crew. right. Um, you know, if you're like, if you're talking more current, then I'm probably going to go Luke Combs and uh, Zach Brown Band and uh, some of that. But uh, mm -hmm. def definitely an '80s guy. Man, I hope I'm stuck on a road trip with you at some point. I'd love all that stuff. Favorite I've pretty, actor. I've Got a pretty good playlist for the golf course. Amen, brother. Uh, favorite actor, actress, or author? Any one of those? Um, author, uh, Stuart Woods and Clive Cussler are two of my favorites. And last thing for you, the North Carolina Pork Council is our title sponsor. I see that. You and, and you're actually a good person to ask this question. Do you have a preference for Eastern style barbecue where you are now, Western style barbecue where you grew up? bacon or any other pork product? So um, I got to say right now, I'm loving Eastern North Carolina barbecue. Uh, it's fantastic. <laughs> I had I had some yesterday. Uh, I'll tell you, I love the low country barbecue down in South Carolina when I was down at the Citadel and some of the mustard base yeah. sauce. So uh, I, I'm a big fan of barbecue periods. So uh, I think it's, it, you know, I think each region does their style the best. That's Coach Houston saying all of the above for, for, no pork, for uh, pork products and barbecue in particular. Coach, I know it's a hectic week. Uh, we're actually taking our tailgate tour to Boone. So I don't know, you might see us or at, asking a question or on the sidelines at Kid Brewer Stadium. Uh, but I've enjoyed getting to know you over the years, and I really appreciate your time on the David Glenn Show. Uh, I always appreciate you, your first class. Uh, safe travels this weekend. We'll see you up in Boone. Go Pirates. Sounds Sounds good, Coach. Take care. That's Mike Houston of ECU. Again, his track record is impeccable. National champion at James Madison, played in the national championship game at Lenore Ryan, successful at the Citadel, where it's a hard place to win in the sport of football. He had them in the national top 15 of the FCS polls during his couple of years there. Uh, we do look forward to seeing the Pirates and Coach Houston. Last week's guest, Sean Clark, of course, will be our host in a sense in and around Kid Brewer Stadium. And remember, we're, we're there with the old North State tailgate. We'll be set up right next to Kid Brewer Stadium in the hours leading up to that kickoff between the Pirates and the Mountaineers. As we thank Coach Houston for his time here on the David Glenn Show and jump back into all other sorts of stuff, college and pro, one quick reminder, in sports, we talk a lot about impact players who make a positive difference. And when it comes to our state's economy, the North Carolina pork industry is a true MVP. Each year, the pork industry plays an important role in supporting rural communities across our state. It contributes more than $10 billion a year to the North Carolina economy and supports more than 44,000 jobs. Learn more about their positive impact at ncpork.org. That's the North Carolina Pork Council, the foundational partner of the North Carolina Sports Network. We will be back with much more right after this. Moving on, you've probably read or heard a lot about the ongoing conference realignment issues in college sports, 
which include the death of the Pac-12 as we know it, the growth of the ACC from 15 to 18 members starting next summer, and the additional expansions in the other Power Four conferences, as you can soon call them, meaning the Big Ten, the SEC, and the Big 12. With these stories in mind, and especially with that recent ACC expansion story in mind, I want you to consider two concepts that may help you truly understand what happened in a way that I don't think most of the realignment media coverage fully grasped. Number one, visual, maybe with an apology. If you know the TV show Seinfeld from back in the day, one of the most successful in American history, one of Jerry's best friends was George, George Costanza, a funky guy. There was, a cat, there was an episode entitled Shrinkage, where the concept of shrinkage involved, let's just say, George getting out of the pool and the pool water had been cold and certain body parts kind of shrink when a male is cold. And I won't get into too many more of the gory details, but you probably get the idea. Believe it or not, the concept of a different kind of shrinkage unrelated to body parts was a huge motivating factor as ACC presidents and chancellors, remember it's not coaches or athletic directors who get the ultimate vote whether or not to expand. And in the end, 12 of the 15 ACC schools did vote to expand with the inclusion of Cal Berkeley, Southern Methodist, and Stanford. A different type of shrinkage kind of scared the ACC presidents and chancellors just as George was very concerned about the perception of his own shrinkage. Another way to look at it, maybe you're just a homeowner and you're worried that the decision of a cranky neighbor, in this case, think of Clem. Let's call your cranky neighbor Clem. And yes, I mean Clemson. Or Flo. And yes, I mean Florida State. Those are the cranky neighbors in the Atlantic Coast Conference, always talking about wanting to leave the ACC because there's not enough TV money. Well, if you consider yourself a homeowner and two of your neighbors are Clem and Flo and the decisions they make or might make scare you a little bit because they're your neighbors. What if they own retaining walls and they might be ready to tear down those retaining walls and you're worried that if they make those decisions, your property is somehow just going to slide into the ocean or slide into the lake. It's out of your control, right? You don't control what your neighbor Clem is going to decide or what your neighbor Flo is going to decide. Just like these ACC presidents don't know for sure if the decision makers at Clemson and Florida State might just say the heck with it. It's an expensive exit fee. It's a weird grant of rights binding us to the ACC. We're going to roll the dice legally and we're going to leave this league. If you were in full control, you wouldn't worry much about your neighbors, would you? Similarly, if you weren't at all worried about forces beyond your control complicating your world, you would look at that world much differently. Remember from the perspective of ACC presidents and chancellors, extending this analogy just a little bit, they had already seen another neighbor of sorts located on the other side of the country slide into the ocean. You know why the Pac-12 doesn't exist anymore? And I'm telling you, this fear was in the back of the minds of the 12 ACC presidents who voted yes on expansion. The Pac-12 figuratively slid into the ocean and doesn't exist anymore. I know the name still exists. I know Oregon State and Washington State are still trying to piece something together. But essentially, the Atlantic Coast Conference, which is struggling financially because of a subpar TV deal, watched the Pac-12 disintegrate. Why? Because that league had an even lesser television deal couldn't get distribution of the Pac-12 TV network. ACC network much more successful than that and was coming to the end of its TV deals out in Pac-12 land. Their failure to negotiate competitive new deals motivated all those schools to flee to either the Big Ten or the Big 12. And that's why functionally, even if there's something called the Pac-12 moving forward, it won't really be a power conference anymore. The ACC folks saw that from the George Costanza shrinkage perspective and they saw it in a different way from the your neighbors Clem and Flo are doing and saying things that make you want to protect yourself in a way that I'm about to describe. If you look through those two lenses, you will understand how this round of ACC expansion happened in a way that 90% of your friends and 99% of those at the local cocktail party have no idea what they're talking about. Flashback. 
When the Atlantic Coast Conference expanded from eight members to nine by adding Florida State in 1992, I was actually covering the league already at that point as a very young journalist in that case. The league's main motivation at the time was very clear, and it's the more common motivation you see with most expansions, at least in the major conferences. The ACC was trying to get better, and because it wanted to pursue the goal of getting better, that required it to get bigger. The league was brilliant in basketball and other sports at the time, but the ACC had not been cons consistently strong in football. Those Florida State Seminoles were in the midst of a dynasty under legendary coach Bobby Bowden, who were one of the best gridiron programs in the entire country. At the time, while playing in an as an independent, like Notre Dame nowadays, on the gridiron, FSU's arrival in the ACC in the early 90s quickly served as a harsh reminder of how far behind the rest of the league's teams were compared to those on college football's top tier. Listen to these numbers. During the Seminoles' first nine seasons in the ACC, 1992 to 2000, the Seminoles posted an astounding 70-2 and two record, 70 wins, only two losses in conference games in that stretch, which to this day is the most dominant stretch by any ACC football team in the history of a league that is now more than 70 years old. In that same period, of course, Florida State was beating almost everybody else, too. In their first nine years as an ACC member, the Seminoles won two national championships, 1993 and 1999, and they posted nine straight top five finishes in the national polls, which had never been done by an ACC team on the football side prior to that and hasn't been done since either. Sure enough, as the ACC became more relevant in football, bigger TV dollars started to flow its way. Sound familiar? The dollars were way bigger that back – way smaller back then. I mean, truly tiny compared to today. But listen to these numbers. Again, the ACC needed to get better in football, so it decided to get bigger. The current expansion does not follow this kind of philosophy in a way that you'll see shortly. In the late 90s, the ACC received about $16 million a year. Remember, it's now like $500 million a year. $16 million a year from its contracts with ABC, ESPN, and back then, Jefferson Pilot. After the Seminoles had that amazing run, and with college football's popularity as a TV product really growing quickly, the ACC received an impressive increase of almost 50%. This is even before it expanded again in the early 2000s to 23 point something million dollars per year in those TV deals. Still not huge money, but a 50% increase reflected the fact that the ACC knew it needed to get better in football, which meant it had to get bigger in football, and that that philosophy clearly paid off with the addition of the Seminoles, both in competitiveness on the field in the gridiron, but also those TV dollars, which were important then, and obviously even more important today. While football TV money was not yet the absolute monster it has become, the, ex the ACC actually made more money from basketball than from football in the 1970s, 1980s, and 1990s. That's not crazy, crazy long ago. Its importance had been growing gradually ever since that 1984 Supreme Court case involving the University of Oklahoma against the NCAA that ended the NCAA's practice of basically monopolizing and selling the TV rights to the college football games nationally. Once the schools themselves, rather than the NCAA itself, could sell their own football TV rights, most of them decided that affiliating with the conference and letting the league offices handle those negotiations on behalf of all conference members, they decided that was the smartest way to go back then. Although Notre Dame famously has remained a football independent and has had its own increasingly lucrative TV deal with NBC since 1991, most other longtime independent football teams – did what Florida State did. They found a conference home in the early 1990s, within a decade after that famous landmark Supreme Court case. 1991, the Big East Conference started sponsoring football for the first time. So the Big East, famous in basketball already, they scoop up longtime gridiron independents at the time, Boston College, Miami, Pittsburgh, Rutgers, Syracuse, Temple, Virginia Tech, and West Virginia. Around the same time, 1991, South Carolina joins the Southeastern Conference. Of course, it was Florida State to the ACC in 1992. It was Penn State to the Big Ten in 1993. You see the theme. You see the picture. 
30 years later, of course, there has been another round of conference realignment in college sports. Given the now extraordinary importance of TV money, and especially football TV money, which again, we estimate makes up more than 80% of the value of those TV deals, just football, men's basketball, 19%, all other sports combined, maybe 1%. Now, many prominent programs have been seek seeking more lucrative homes, good place so seeking a better place. And the top conferences especially have had interesting decisions to make about whether to expand and if so, which suitors to bring into the fold. The two wealthiest conferences in America, and they've been this for at least a decade now, the Big Ten and the SEC, have been able to make their expansion decisions from positions of strength and tremendous leverage. Everybody wants to be a part of their league. They can be choosy. They can be picky. They can be selective. They would have been okay without expanding, but they certainly weren't going to add any new schools unless their football programs added significant value to the Big Ten's TV deals or the SEC's TV deals. When the Big Ten opted to expand, what happened? It added the four most prominent and four most valuable football programs from the crumbling Pac-12. Look at the TV numbers. You'll see that Oregon and Southern Cal and UCLA and Washington were the four most watched in recent times football programs in the Pac-12. Not mere coincidence that they're the four that the Big Ten said yes to when they came calling. When the SEC opted to expand, again, from a position of great strength financially and otherwise and great leverage in every way, the SEC added the two most prominent and two most valuable football programs from the middling Big 12, Oklahoma and Texas. When the ACC and the Big 12, still two power conferences, but they've gradually fallen far behind the Big 10 and the SEC financially, when those two second-tier leagues opted to expand, they were essentially stuck picking over the leftovers, which brings us to the ACC's expansion here in 2023. In the ACC's case, only a bizarre, unprecedented set of circumstances enabled the league to get the required 12 votes in favor of expansion. Again, remember, Clemson, Florida State, and North Carolina were no's all along, and at other times, under various proposals, NC State was a no, and at other times, Miami was a no, and at other times, some other schools were skeptical about voting yes. Again, the ACC bylaws required 12 at least votes out of the 15 to confirm any expansion candidate. Here's the crazy part, folks. Y'all know, as viewers or listeners of this show, that football TV money and really football prominence is now the tail that wags the dog of college athletics. The answers to these questions do not suggest why the ACC got 12 votes in favor of expansion. Does anyone really believe that California, Southern Methodist, and Stanford will upgrade the caliber of ACC football? The honest answer is no. And I don't mean your answer or my answer. We could look at the records. We could look at the TV numbers. I'm telling you it's no. I mean, even the 12 university presidents who voted yes know that the answer to that question is no. Next question. Does anyone really believe that those same three schools will add significant value and I mean beyond what they will cost as extra mouths to feed once they become full financial partners to the ACC's future television deals? No. Does anyone really believe that it makes sense for a league called the Atlantic Coast Conference to add one school located in Texas and two schools located near the Pacific Ocean, especially given the new travel expenses and the additional burdens on athletes and all those other sports which don't turn profits? Answer again, no, if not hell no. So why then, if all 12 of those presidents and chancellors knew the answers to those basic questions were no, remember the ACC added Florida State because they knew it would help their TV football brand and they knew it would help them competitively on the field. With these three expansion candidates, the answers are no, no, and no. Well, the answer is that oddly, unlike the Florida State expansion decision of more than 30 years ago, 12 ACC schools ultimately decided, shrinkage style or fear of shrinkage style, that at least under this unusual set of circumstances, it was very important for the ACC to get bigger, even though the ACC realized the league probably won't be any better on the gridiron. I know that sounds crazy, but this is how it happened, folks. 
The only way to comprehend this logic is to understand the various contracts and forces in play. For example, the ACC's subpar television deal with ESPN, which remember is signed and locked all the way through 25, 2035, 36. That allows ESPN to negotiate the value of the ACC's contract downward if the league ever drops below its current 15 members. Given that the ACC's football TV deal, already below market, is a major problem as we speak, the idea of that contract potentially getting worse where Florida State or Clemson or somebody else to leave is among these university presidents and chancellors' absolute worst nightmares. By some estimates, Clemson and Florida State, by far the ACC's most valuable football brands, together comprise as much as 30% of the conference's gridiron-related TV revenue. The Tigers and the Seminoles, if you don't know, routinely, routinely draw football TV audiences that are two or three times the average audiences of most other ACC schools. If one or both of FSU and Clemson were to leave the ACC, the league's contract with ESPN likely would take a massive hit, again, because the contract has a clause that says, if you ACC fall below 15 members, we ESPN get to come back in and reevaluate what we're paying you on an annual basis. The ACC's expansion to 18 members, of course, means that that same clause, if you fall below 15 members of the ESPN contract, would not be triggered unless four schools, rather than just one school under the current circumstances, decided to leave. In a sense, the recent threatening comments of Florida State very publicly, but also Clemson more privately, about leaving the ACC scared 12 league presidents into this odd defensive posture. Again, you're the neighbor in between Clem and Flo, worried about what they're going to do. You're George Costanza, worried about shrinkage, in this case, the ACC falling below a 15-school membership. While it is true that the ACC's significant exit fee, $120 million plus, and especially its grant of rights, which leaves the value of any departing school's TV rights with the ACC through 2036, an amount estimated to be worth 300 to $400 million per school. These do represent significant deterrence for any ACC school contemplating a departure anytime soon. However, it is also true that the attorneys advising these university presidents almost always avoid speaking in absolute terms. What do I mean? Those 12 presidents in the ACC who voted yes on expansion would ask their attorney, can Clemson leave? Can Florida State leave? I'm an attorney. I know how to answer these questions. You never tell your client that you're 100% certain that something is not going to happen. What The way you have to answer those president's questions and chancellor's questions are more, we can't predict what Clemson or Florida State might do. We just feel strongly that they'll have to pay an exit fee of $120 million plus, and they'll be leaving behind that grant of rights all the way through 2036. In other words, the, president, the presidents want to hear, there's no way Clemson and Florida State can leave. They want to hear that because they're afraid of the contract with ESPN falling below the 15 school membership and, and reopening the value of that deal. Their attorneys will not tell them there's no way Clemson and Florida State will leave. The attorneys can't say that. You can't chain those schools to a chair and not let them leave. All you can say is that if Clemson and Florida State or one or either or both leave, we will hold them. The ACC will hold them accountable financially. But you can't stop them from leaving. There's a difference. That fear, that unwillingness of those attorneys to tell those 12 presidents, oh, no, there's no way they'll leave, left enough of a smidgen of a doubt for those ACC presidents to take that defensive posture and vote in favor of expansion. This round of ACC expansion also would not have happened, zero chance, unless the three newcomers agreed to limit or postpone their shares of the league's television money. You might know these facts by now. These, unlike what I just mentioned, have been well reported by the media. SMU, member of the American Athletic Conference, essentially bought its way into the ACC. That is not an exaggeration. That is a statement of fact, even if it's worded in a way that's much different than one of these, you know, an ACC commissioner would say it or a university president would say it. 
I'll tell you because it's the truth. SMU bought its way into the Atlantic Coast Conference, period. The Mustangs will forego their share of the new league's TV revenue for their first nine years as a member. That amount is estimated to be in the $300 million range, and it will instead of going to the Mustangs, it will be spread among existing ACC members in a variety of ways. Cal and Stanford, longtime Pac-12 members who had watched that league lose four members to the Big Ten and four more to the Big 12, mainly because of the Pac-12's repeated failures to secure that competitive TV deal that I mentioned. Their deals expire next year. They'll receive, Cal and Stanford, only a 30% share of TV revenue for their first seven years in the ACC. They won't be full financial members until their 10th year in the league. That's the 2033-34 academic year. By 2034, of course, guess what? The ACC finally will be able to begin negotiations on its next TV deal. They haven't been able to do that for a decade at this point. At that point, it'll be two decades since they got to no negotiate a new TV deal. The hope is that the league's latest round of expansion, which does bring in $72 million per year in new ESPN money, and tens of millions more in new ACC network money each year, thanks to the additions of two new top 10 markets in America, that is the Dallas-Fort Worth area where SMU is located, but also the Northern California market where both Stal and Canford, uh, Cal and Stanford are located. Together, there's five and a half million TV households just in those two markets. Again, two of the 10 biggest markets TV-wise in America. And especially those creative details financially, about what the Mustangs, the Bears, and the Cardinal will not take out of the ACC's uh, treasure chest, at least for a long time. Those, that combination of factors, that, that perfect storm, if you will, those 12 ACC presidents hope and believe will be enough to stabilize the league for at least a while longer. At least they know this, George Costanza style, Clem and Flo style. If anyone does decide to leave under the new rules, the ACC presidents just protected themselves from their worst nightmare shrinkage scenario. Moving on. On the other side, a quick glance back and a more thorough look ahead in the world of college football, including my three to see games with a heavy state of North Carolina flavor on this Saturday's gridiron schedule. As we encourage you to check out our weekly Old North State Tailgate podcast, which drops every Friday night or Saturday morning during college football season and allows for an even deeper dive into last weekend's results and this weekend's upcoming action, we move on to one of our weekly features, which I call Three to See, meaning three games that rank among those most worth watching this weekend, with, of course, that heavy dose of State of North Carolina and ACC angles, as you might guess or expect. First, let me point out there is not a single game in all of college football this weekend that matches a top 25 team against another top 25 team, at least not in the FBS ranks. We actually had that twice last week with number 11 Texas going to Alabama and knocking off the number three Crimson Tide 34-24 in what turned out to be, unsurprisingly, the most watched game of the entire college football weekend with an average audience of 8.8 .8 million viewers. We even had it with number 20 Ole Miss beating number 24 Tulane 37 to 20. In week one, remember, we had number eight Florida State stomping number five LSU in a head to head battle of teams ranked in the national top 10, which is always a rare treat, at least during college football's regular season. Again, this week, there's no such high profile game nationally, although there are some other potentially good ones involving our state's teams and otherwise. Quick side note, if you are curious about which college football games and which college football teams are drawing the largest TV audiences, an increasingly important category that has become a significant sort of currency, if you will, in major college athletics these days, please check out our weekly summaries of that topic at our website, ncsportsnetwork.com. There you will see all the actual Nielsen TV and streaming numbers and data that show, for example, how the FSU-LSU game and the Clemson-Duke game on Labor Day night and the UNC-South Carolina game that we saw in Charlotte all made the ACC a huge national TV success story in week one this year. Moving on, 
Here's our three to see this week in college football beyond that East Carolina App State matchup in Boone, which we'll discuss more thoroughly on our weekly Old North State Tailgate podcast, which again drops every Friday night or Saturday morning here on this YouTube channel, which you can always find by simply clicking the watch button at our website, ncsportsnetwork.com. Game number one, 2-0 and Minnesota visits 2-0 and North Carolina. The Tar Heels are ranked number 20 nationally, and last I looked, we're a seven or eight point favorite. That's a Saturday game, 3.30 p.m. on ESPN. Although Carolina barely survived App State in double overtime last week, the Tar Heels deserve credit in my eyes for starting 2-0, even without seeing the best of star quarterback Drake May. The primary reason UNC beat South Carolina in the opener was defense, with the Heels sacking Gamecocks quarterback Spencer Rattler nine times for Carolina's best sack total in almost a quarter century. The primary reason Carolina beat App State last week was the Tar Heels' running game, led by an offensive line that often dominated the Mountaineers, helping running back Omarion Hampton to various national and ACC accolades with his 26 carry, 234 yards, three touchdowns on the ground performance, which included a 68-yard touchdown run early in the game and then a 17-yard TD run with the game on the line in the first overtime. Important reminder, one of the reasons that UNC coach Mack Brown and former Carolina offensive coordinator Phil Longo often clashed in recent years. Remember, Longo left after last season to take the Wisconsin offensive coordinator job which certainly raises a lot of fair questions about why any offensive assistant would want to leave with NFL prospect Drake May going into his final college season. That is uh, uh, an odd decision to say the least, and it suggests some friction between Mac Brown and Phil Longo. From Brown's perspective, Longo would keep throwing the ball too often, even when the opposing defense was essentially daring the Tar Heels to run the ball with their defensive schemes. Well, new offensive coordinator Chip Lindsey at UNC, who comes from the Gus Malzahn coaching tree, is a little bit less air raid minded like Longo and is more in favor of a better run pass balance. You know, like Dabo Sweeney called it the dirt raid at Clemson rather than the air raid and that taking what the defense gives you. Sure enough, Lindsey's way ultimately paid off against App State. I don't believe Mac Brown believes Phil Longo's way would have paid off in the same kind of way. It was a close call in the end. That game could have gone either way between the Mountaineers and the Tar Heels. Just remember that philosophical difference on the Carolina offense in this final season of Drake May as the season moves forward. Against 2-0 Minnesota on Saturday, it's a well-coached team under P.J. Fleck that has gone to four bowl games in the last five years and has won all four of those bowl games. The Tar Heels likely will need another all-hands-on-deck performance to get to 3-0, and I think they're going to need the best performance yet from May, who is completing 73% of his passes but has only two TD throws in the entire season so far. Minnesota's defense, was, which was truly dominating two years ago, meaning 2021, that defense has started this season in that same vein, yielding an average of only eight, eight points per game in its low-scoring victories over Eastern Michigan and Nebraska. It may be up to Carolina's resurgent defense, brilliant against South Carolina, but only so-so against App State, to exploit a Minnesota offense that does have a big-time tight end in Brevin Span Ford and a big-time wide receiver in Chris Ottman Bell, a guy who's been limited by injury so far this season. But that same Minnesota offense has not found much chemistry overall through the Gophers' defensively-oriented 2-0 start. Game number two of our three to see. 1-1 one one Northwestern visits 2-0 Duke. Devils are ranked number 21 nationally and favored in this game, Saturday, 3.30 ACC Network. These two schools are a lot alike. Small, private, academically elite universities trying to compete in a sport that is dominated mostly by large public institutions with, frankly, far less challenging academic standards such as Alabama, Clemson, Georgia, Michigan, Ohio State, and the rest. And right now, the Wildcats have fallen on hard times on and off the field with their scandal and otherwise, while the Blue Devils are actually competing at a level we haven't seen from them often in really the last 60 years, 6-0. Duke has finished in the national top 25 only once since 1962, and that was a decade ago in 2013 under our old friend David Cutcliffe. If the Devils are going to do that again this year, 
They're going to have to beat Northwestern because among their remaining opponents this season are Notre Dame, NC State, Florida State, Louisville, Wake Forest, UNC, Pittsburgh, et cetera. You could be a pretty good football team and still finish eight and four or seven and five, which obviously would not be enough for a top 25 finish. Mike Elko, last year's ACC Coach of the Year, and deservedly so after the Devils' 9-4 and four campaign. He is now 11-4 and four to begin his tenure in Durham, and that is the best 15-game start for any coach in Duke football history. That is impressive in part because a very long time ago, Duke was actually a national power in football. I would have thought a Bill Murray or an Eddie Cameron or a Wallace Wade or some other old-timer would have had that particular record. No, nope, it's Mike Elko. At number 21 in the national rankings right now, the Blue Devils are back in the national top 25 for the first time since 2018, which proved to be the program's final winning season under Cutcliffe. The Blue Devils have an elite quarterback in Riley Leonard, two big-time offensive linemen in Graham Barton and Jacob Monk, quality depth at wide receiver led by Jalen Calhoun, and quality depth at running back. They also have a well-coached defense under Elko, led by tackle Dwayne Carter and safety Jalen Stinson. They're flat out better than Northwestern right now, and I expect them to show that this weekend. Number three in our three to see, 2-0 North Carolina Central, number 17 in the latest FCS poll, visits 2-0 UCLA, which is number 24 in the latest FBS poll. This game is also Saturday, 5 o'clock, televised on the Pac-12 network. Let me start by saying no. I do not expect the Eagles of NC Central to travel all the way across the country and beat UCLA at Rose Bowl Stadium in Pasadena. I just watched Central play. We were in Greensboro last Saturday with our old North State tailgate for Central's impressive win at North Carolina A&T in the annual Aggie Eagle Classic. I hope you'll check out Mike Waddell's uncut video from our trip out there. And I honestly don't know if they can even be competitive, the Eagles against the Bruins, who have been pretty good and a bowl team these last two years under Coach Chip Kelly. And now they're back in the national top 25, both of these teams, this season. These two schools have never played in football. And I'm just excited for these central players and Coach Trey Oliver to get a chance to play out there in the L.A. area at one of college football's most famous venues, meaning the Rose Bowl. Remember, too, that the Eagles have one of the greatest quarterbacks in school history, the reigning MEAC player of the year, Davius Richard, who is on the radar of NFL scouts, and they're also the defending HBCU national champions. Just remember two things. Number one, FCS teams beat FBS teams literally every year. Doesn't happen often, but it does happen every year. In 2018, for example, right here in our backyard, North Carolina a and beat East Carolina 28-23. to It's actually already happened three times this season, although not yet to any of the FBS teams in what we still get to call the Power Five conferences for one more year, with the Pac-12 currently in that final season as a top-tier league. But even that, an FCS team beating a Power Five team does happen every year. In 2022, Southern Illinois beat Northwestern of the Big Ten. In 2021, Montana beat Washington of the Pac-12. Jacksonville State beat Florida State of the ACC. The list goes on and on with examples going all the way back in the 1970s when we used to call the FCS, the FCS ranks the 1AA ranks. My number two reminder on this topic is our state's history with these FCS over FBS stories. The starting point, of course, is that a team from our state is responsible for the most famous victory ever by an FCS team over an FBS opponent. That was App State going to number five Michigan, beating the Wolverines at the Big House in 2007 before the Mountaineers made that jump to the FBS ranks. I have always thought that our state also is responsible for another of the most intriguing stories involving an FCS team beating an FBS opponent. You have to be of a certain age or older to remember the story, but I think anyone can appreciate this story. In 1984, Furman, a 1AA team from South Carolina, beat NC State of the ACC 34-30. The very next year, 1985, Furman not only beats the Wolfpack again, the Paladins stomp the Pack 42-20. to The NC State administration, obviously disgruntled by these back-to-back losses to an FCS opponent, opponent, but also inspired by the coach on the opposite sidelines, fired the Wolfpack's coach, Tom Reed, whose career in Raleigh consisted of three straight three-and-eight seasons, and hired Furman's coach, Dick Sheridan, 
who after those back-to-back upset victories over NC State, went on to become one of the greatest head coaches in Wolfpack football history. The moral of that story, of course, if you can't beat them, hire them. Finally, for anyone wondering, yes, the longstanding members of the SBS, FBS ranks in our state all have been bitten by the FCS bug, at least occasionally. Duke has lost to the Richmond Spiders three times in the last 20 years. The Wolfpack lost to East Tennessee State in the early years of the Sheridan era. UNC got trounced by Furman 28-3 in 1999 during the disastrous Carl Torbush era, immediately after the Tar Heels' incredible run under Mac Brown for most of the 1990s. App State, by the way, beat Wake Forest head-to-head six times from 1983 to most recently the year 2000, again, before the Mountaineers jumped to the FBS ranks. As we come down the stretch on today's program, quick note about our brand new Old North State Tailgate and Traveling Sports Circus, which already has had four tour stops, Cary, Wrightsville Beach, Charlotte, and Greensboro, and will visit App State in Boone this week and Elon University near the end of September. For more details on those tour stops and the rest of our 2023 schedule, which is taking us truly from the beach to the mountains and most other places you'd like to visit in between, please follow us on Twitter, at ONS Tailgate, and visit our website, ncsportsnetwork.com. If you're at the ECU App State game, look for Mike Waddell, me, and our assistants in the brick area that surrounds the rock just outside of Kid Brewer Stadium. Last thing is our weekly reminder. Please subscribe to our official YouTube channel, Instagram, Twitter accounts here at the North Carolina Sports Network. Our social media handle is at the NC Sports Net, our website, ncsportsnetwork.com. When you subscribe to the YouTube channel, you are automatically eligible for very cool prizes, including free tickets, free golf, free concerts, free dinners at some of North Carolina's best restaurants. You can do those things with or without me if you're a winner. We'll be randomly drawing new winners when we hit 750 and 1,000 subscribers, and the first of those thresholds is almost here. So please subscribe just smash the subscribe button at youtube.com slash the NC Sportsnet. Uh, all of those prizes, remember, whether you were subscriber number one or number 999, you remain eligible for any of these prizes that we give away along the way and will continue to do in the coming weeks and months. That'll do it for today's edition of the program. The David Glenn Show is an exclusive production of the North Carolina Sports Network. Executive producer and technical director, Mike Waddell, The founding partner of NCSN is the North Carolina Pork Council. Goodbye, everybody. Thanks for spending some time with us today on the David Glenn Show and the North Carolina Sports Network. We look forward to seeing you again, maybe even in Boone on Saturday morning. Thanks again for being with us, everybody. Have a great week. Enjoy the football. We look forward to seeing you again next time.